Hello, and welcome to the webinar, How Open Audience Will Drive Audience Engagement in a Cookieless Environment. I am your moderator, Calvin Sharfs, and I will be your host. Today, we'll be looking at ways to overcome the challenges presented in the ad tech world and give you insights into OpenX's solution, Open Audience. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the feature of today's webinar and what to expect from our presentation today. We will spend about 40 minutes covering the content, leaving plenty of time for QA. If at any point you have a question, simply use the Q&A feature in WebEx to type your question, and we will get to as many of them as possible by the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on demand, and you will receive an email with that link as soon as possible. OpenX has invested the last two years and millions of dollars in the development of Open Audience. Our speaker today is Todd Parsons, Chief Product Officer at OpenX. The largest advertising, independent advertising exchange focused on making the efficient people-based marketing buying experience. Todd has nearly 20 years of experience in advertising technology and prior to OpenX has led teams at the likes of Axiom and Social Code. We'd like to welcome Todd and I will pass it over to you. Hey, thanks Calvin and uh, good morning everyone. Um, let's get right into this. Um, we were all together, a good portion of us anyway, um, just over a month ago for the first of three webinars uh, that uh, are in this series. Um, OpenX wants to do a lot of these, and I should say, you know, before we get uh, too deep, that um, we've gotten some great feedback from attendees, and, um, we, you know, we're super excited to get more. Um, so that we can tune this content and you know, hopefully do a lot of these if they're useful in the future. So, as I said, our first webinar focused on, you know, what we think at OpenX our industry should be focusing on in a, in a post GDPR, a post CCPA um, world, um, you know, without the benefit of cookies and, you know, in an environment where platforms, um, also referred to as the walled gardens are increasingly taking share of ad spend from programmatic and other methods. Um, we introduced in that webinar, just to, for those of you who weren't there, um, we introduced how identity, consumer identity, um, adding user context to, to persistent consumer identity and programmatic can all work together um, to deliver people-based marketing, as Calvin said. Um, that help address each of these challenges um, as we get around the corner. Oh, in this webinar, we're going to go a little bit deeper um, into the solution set that OpenX has been working on um, called Open Audience. We're going to look at a lot of technical stuff today. Uh, I hope that we can keep your attention while we're going through that. Um, one of the things that a lot of people ask for is to kind of avoid the rhetoric and the froth around some of these issues that, that, that I just put on the table um, and get into the approach. And we're gonna go ahead and, and do that. Um, all for the sake of, of uh, ultimately benefiting marketing outcomes through the publishers that we work with at OpenX, over 2,500 of them for the last 12 years. Okay, so now if we can just get to the next slide uh, here, Calvin, one more. Um, I've got a um, I've got a little histogram, rather a timeline um, that is a, a slightly different from what what uh, pr I presented um, with Travis Klinger from LiveRamp in our first webinar, and th this basically just takes everybody through um, quick redux from the introduction of GDPR um, to uh, Apple rolling out ITP, um, Mozilla. Um, uh, announcing its enhanced tracking prevention on Firefox. Um, we're very uh, briefly into the enforcement period for CCPA now, starting in January. And of course, we're on the tick or on the clock for third party cookies um, ultimately going away in the next two years in Chrome. Um, and, and in substitution, um, a lot of questions being asked. So, not much more you know, to talk about here. Um, just to say that um, that in the next slide, really the summation is that with all these headwinds, we know and marketers know that people-based marketing works best in terms of creating advertising results if you can get to it and make it work without all the complexity 
and all of these things in the background that 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 take away from our ability to deliver it. Um, so I'm going to get right into uh, what publishers can do um, about this situation. Um, if, if you go to the next slide, I mean, there are really three things that that uh, we're going to dig into today. One is, um, and this gets brushed over a lot. It's uh, um, a little. It, it can be honestly a little annoying at times. The the uh, idea that that publishers are just accustomed to acting like a brand who seeks a, a, a customer through a prospect and a whole lot of rights to that that govern that relationship, you know, isn't the way that things have worked in the open web world per se. Um, you've got this concept of website visitors and app users um, and, and the cookie has allowed us um, and device IDs have allowed us to proxy the relationship rights that brands have been used to working with consumers on for, for years. So this idea of helping publishers into the first party data relationship realm with their visitors and their subscribers is very much top of mind for us. Um, but I think in ad tech, what I've noticed as a trend is that you know a lot of folks are asking publishers just to figure that out on their own. Uh, we don't want to do that. Um, we want to help, um, and we want to be material about our help. The second thing is really kind of changing the addressability of consumers across the open web from the supply side, from the publisher side, by leveraging not just one but uh, but a number of identity solutions. Um, and we're going to take you through. Our approach to to uh, to to uh, federating the view of consumers across supply. Not saying it's the right one or the only one, but we, as Calvin said, we're about a year into into product builds. I can give you a lot in terms of what we've built and also the direction. Uh, point of this webinar is to get a lot more feedback from our listeners and our partners about what we can do differently and better. The third thing is uh, the idea of kind of taking this new addressable graph built from first party data in the first two uh, uh, boxes there um, and, and actually uncover more value uh, for those things in programmatic. Um, that's not just uh, 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 data portability, but it's monetization. Uh, it also, from a marketer standpoint, is marketing performance. Um, so I'm gonna dig into each of these just a teeny bit more. And and then you know we'll we'll go into the technical parts of our conversation. So this first piece in in terms of strengthening customer relationships, I just want to go one click down on on what I'm talking about here. Uh, we think that that the new world of privacy is very much like the consumer relationship with with a brand. That you know I as an individual need to be sure my privacy and data rights are going to be honored. As part of my relationship with the publisher, we think publishers should be uh, seeking very explicit permission for those rights um, and, and to honor privacy. Simple as that. So from a product standpoint, what that makes us do at our company and with partners is to think about a privacy first mandate um, in everything that we build. Um, so, so that means reviewing um, uh, 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 interactions, it means reviewing legislation, it, it, it means accommodating current compliance, not just on our side, but, but with our partners, whether brand or publisher or technical platform. Um, so the, the second thing there is obviously more publisher tools for first party data collection and management. We aren't, um, uh, I, I would say we're not confident enough to say that we would be the source of those tools. What we would say is, we think our role is much more to be a, uh, um, a support to collecting uh, uh, and managing data from those tools. I'll go into that in a second here. And the last thing in particular is just to start nailing the, the value exchange between me and everyone on this call as a consumer and a publisher for first party data exchange. I'm gonna go into examples in, a, in, um, in, in upcoming slides. Next slide uh, basically just goes to this thing called addressability. I want to be clear what that means. Cookies have been 
as I said, our crutch for addressability uh, that are, are kind of the best shot at a universal ID for a very long time now, indeed, since I started uh, my, my own career in the space. And what we know through studies um, from our partners like Google, a very important partner to OpenX, is that when you remove the third party cookie, revenue goes with it. Um, now, we've seen this in, um, in each of the aforementioned uh, 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 browser actions with Apple's IPP and, and with Firefox. Um, we saw drops in monetization with our publishers and have been working hard to prevent that from happening on a much larger scale um, when, when Chrome goes into its enforcement period. So, uh, but the point here is a lot of downside if we don't replace third party cookies with durable and portable identity solutions. There's a scale component to that that we'll touch as well. Okay, next thing with activation. Again, just one click deeper on this. Um, you got to kind of, the, the, the discussion about IDs and identity in general has gotten very frothy with all of these other issues um, that, that we've been talking about as an ecosystem, as an industry. Um, the way we look at it is, um, is pretty simple. In the post cookie world, you've got a lot of different identity solutions to consider and look at, all of which need to be need to create that addressability quotient that I described in the prior slide. And also each of these has unique strengths and weaknesses and each of them brings demand um, because of how they're positioned in the ecosystem, some more and some less um, demand being publisher revenue, just to be specific. So, um, you know, our view is kind of twofold here and the diagram on the right, what I've said is open audience looks to federate um, or to be a container of identity solutions in such a way that they're not just being passed into the ecosystem for targeting, but that audiences can be aggregated and deduplicated across them. That's a really important point especially when you look at more durable identifiers that are attached to offline data, like live intent being attached to an email, or like live ramp being attached to a Billitech, which is the offline uh, data store um, that is about 40 years old. Um, at the bottom there, it's just as important to say for the time being, before cookies are completely off the table as the universal ID, to be conscious of the value and, and actually great value of what are called the unified identity solutions. Those that have been much more about syncing cookie pools and device pools between parties that have, uh, have been uh, you know, part of the programmatic foundation. So the Trade Desk Unified ID solution is really the one that's been most successful there. ID5, if anyone on the call is familiar with ID5, is an upstart in Europe that's done pretty well. But the point here is that there's a bit of feathering going on between the moment we're at right now with cookie-based IDs, um, so-called unified IDs, and those that are tied to offline data stores like LiveRamp or like Live Intent. Okay, so let's go go forward. We're going to talk about each of these a little bit deeper yet again. Um, I wanted to get into a conversation first about this collecting and using first party data and, uh, and permission, because like I said, this is something that we tend to hand wave at a little too quickly. So at OpenX, we have this concept product wise of consumer uh, subscriptions. I'm going to talk about the open audience data model in just a second, but first I want to talk about what's the right way or what are possible ways for any publisher, any app builder to collect what we call consumer subscriptions. Um, a subscription, just to be super clear, is the collection of first party data in exchange for value that the consumer completely understands and is kosher. Okay, so there are three examples that I gave here, um, and none of this is going to be particularly new, um, but it but it's important to cover off on it. First of all, you have the the uh, consent management platforms. These guys have been um, trading uh, a cookie for personalization um, without a whole lot of of description for a while now. 
um, and doing a pretty good job. So um, when you get to your site, you say, um, uh, I'm happy to um, have a personalized experience for my cookie to be accessed. What we've seen, of course, is as regulations have changed, especially CCPA, the CMPs are building features for collecting first party data to whether that be an email or otherwise. So these platforms are getting more sophisticated in collecting first party data in exchange for personalization. And there will be more because each of these folks has already some skin in the game um, with uh, compliance management. The second thing that um, is interesting to note as a source for first party data and one that's been very effective um, uh, across the open web is newsletters. Um, something as simple as me trading my email for uh, unique content that comes to my inbox rather than to my web session, um, but is the foundation for the identity uh, relationship I might have with a publisher, a favorite publisher, a business insider, say, for example. Um, and then the third one is very much emergent. So, I mean, some folks like the New York Times have been at the paywall experience for a long time and super committed to it. A lot of others are deeply in experimentation mode. Um, and we hear that all the time from our publishing partners. Uh, but the idea is really simple, whether it's a freemium style offer or whether it's a hard paywall or something in between, the idea of trading unique content for my permission and my data rights on a first party basis is something that is gonna accelerate massively now. Um, so of course, a lot of publishers feel like they're caught in the middle here. Some of them don't feel like they have the uniqueness of data, for instance, to be able to, to make this model uh, supportable. Um, and we're working with each of those guys because there's a continuum of possibilities here. Um, but the big challenge again is, you know, getting pubs familiar with the approach and then making these things work at scale. It's a long process to collect and manage first party data, but once it's done, the power will be in the hands of the holder of the data, just as we see with brands before publisher. So nobody's really complaining about Facebook being a blocker to consumers like the browsers might be. Why do you think that is? Because brands have the balance of power in owning relationships and first party data with consumers. So our view is, these consumer subscriptions, which are between consumer and, and publisher, our partners, are absolutely critical to get right in the next two years. And we want to help and make sure that that, that happens. Next slide is going to show you how this plays out in a data model. I just gave you a little teeny view of how we look at consumers and their subscription relationships. You say, well, what the heck does that mean to scale advertising uh, and especially people-based or identity-based advertising? Um, and what I've done here is I've said, well, here, this is my attempt at simplifying our data model at, uh, at OpenX for open audience. Um, so you see a consumer here and you can imagine the, the consumer being me interacting with each of those three things that I presented on the prior slide. But now they're going to be doing that on different publishers across the open web. So publisher A, publisher B, publisher C, one of them might have a CMP, one of them might have an email newsletter offer, one of them might have a paywall. Um, so basically, this is the way we look at the open web. We say a consumer is a publisher, visitor, and subscriber of any uh, of, of any of the um, of the other two a publisher is a domain or an app or or, or um, collections of those with consumer visitors and subscribers and as i mentioned before a subscription is merely an instrument a data object where uh, first party data my first party data is exchanged for rights and portability um, and this Im importantly exists between publisher and consumer. So we think pushing rights management and data collection to the edge is super important and where the edge is the publisher, okay? Not necessarily to the consumer device. You've heard a lot of rigmarole around, about that. Um, but we think about managing at the point of collection and that's at the, at the publisher. Okay, so it's all a big network. It's um, you know pr pretty um, 
hard to see how privacy gets managed um, until we go into more detail. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So the next slide. Next slide is going to show you kind of what, what uh, we wanted to call the subscription value exchange. This is a little bit remedial, and you'll have to pardon me, but a lot of people, I think, get just get lost in the high-level conversation that I talk to. So I, I like to try to lay things out a little bit more simply. Here, all we're doing is showing my path to the variety of publishers we saw in a slightly different way, where publisher rights capture is in the middle in subscriptions, meaning that Todd actually went through a CMP and said, use my cookie while it exists for personalization. And the pub from domain, the single domain pub responded with that personalization. And then, it, of course, you can go through the same uh, workflow, the same value exchange for the email newsletter and the paywall, um, where personalization content or some other value is being returned by the three publishers. Okay, and if you go to the next slide, I am going somewhere with this, I promise. Um, don't want anyone falling asleep while we're getting the high level stuff out of the way. What we're doing now is we're saying that, um, that somebody in the ecosystem has to capture that join of, of, of data, of first party data, of associated rights, and some of the actions that are responded to downstream as those rights are conveyed to publisher A, B, and C. We do this with um, a library called Open Audience or JS or OAJS. And what we're doing there is we're capture, capturing anonymized opt-in information. We're persisting it on our publisher's domain um, as publisher-specific IDs, meaning Publisher A owns its own version of an ID. It is sitting in their first party data storage in a variety of ways I will cover, not just a first party cookie, um, but other versions as well. And then the idea is for OHAS to make that scalable by making it portable across publishers as they might desire, okay? So I'm gonna go into the next um, slide here. And let's look at how first party data coming through these paths that I illustrated is being stored. This is a really hot one. There, this last week, there was a lot of mumbling on ad exchanger about first party cookies and well, we're back to first party cookie workarounds in the publisher universe and a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of discussion about that. Not many people raising their hands and saying, I got a solution for it. That's a little disappointing. Um, but I wanted to kind of get to the bottom of this because first party cookies still have a tremendous amount of value. If you're a developer um, and we are, um, you know, you, you look at using the tools for portability um, and, and just technically look for the things that people have adopted most as, uh, as something you wanna lean into first. Well, we do that with our publishers here. You can see on the left-hand side, it's a little inscrutable on the, on the screen I'm looking at, I apologize, but in that colored text at the bottom, you have a first party cookie in which a, a number of ID partners that open uh, audience supports are being written, okay? Um, importantly, we write our own ID, um, the open audience ID into that string so that we can federate the live ramp, the tap ad, the, 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 um, the live intent ID, the trade desk ID. Uh, so publishers don't have to, okay? Uh, right now, a lot of these IDs, they, they run in pre-bid. Uh, publishers are pretty hot on pre-bid right now. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, but, the, but they're operating independently. In other words, they haven't been federated um, by, uh, by an overarching ID in a way that rights can be managed and personalization or content can be delivered. That's the point here. So first party cookie still something we use. We're gonna continue using it. Most monetization is coming right now from unified identity solutions, which ride on cookies. Um, I mentioned the trade desk ID. We watch the money flow in our ecosystem. I can tell you, um, that 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 most dollars are now coming through those unified IDs. Um, a, as first party data is collected and used, that is very likely to change. And of course, it will abruptly change when the cookie disappears. 
But for now, our job is to make sure that our publishers get the benefit of both. Okay, the second thing is a very popular trend is collecting first party data, as I said, just like a brand is doing and persisting it to uh, their own uh, uh, database, a publisher. Um, here there's a, a snapshot of Snowflake um, and data sharing between owners of Snowflake instance. Um, that's a, a, a popular package. Um, and, and really there's nothing special here. It's just a, um, you know, relational database work being done um, in, in, in such a way that first party data can be persisted along with the rights that have been granted on it, and it can be shared from those stores, only it's not happening vis-a-vis -vis a first party cookie, okay? And then lastly, you have open audience. Obviously, we have some bias towards open audience because we've been building it. We built it with this kind of perspective that um, in the abstract, all of the data rights and identity need to be pulled up a level in such a way that they're portable across publishers um, given a publisher's opt-in. So open audience is, um, is something that stores the variety of, uh, of identity partners, some third-party data, um, and all the information about domains in such a way that we can run the combination across that entire gamut and provide a unified supply experience for people-based marketing. So I've given you three ways that this information is being written. Of course, open audience is a bit of a cheat because we don't accept any PII or, or personal data into open audience. We are only taking in fully anonymized information, but we are pulling it up in the abstract as a collection of identities so that Todd can be looked at as an iPhone device holder with a certain number of impressions per day and a Chrome user with a certain number of impressions per day, and a household with a mailbox that might be mailed in the future, which is what every single marketer wants. Okay, so that's the open audience's role, a little different from what we want publishers to do and to help them do with um, first party data. Now I can ground that just a tiny bit in the next slide. That was just storage. And I would love to hear your questions about storage because that's a hot topic. Um, but I want to get to this idea of scaled reach and permitted reach, this thing that I talked about open audience doing. Um, and you'll pardon the kind of geeky diagrams, I hope, um, uh, for this. If you, if, if you want to tear apart any one of these in a separate session or with me personally, one of the folks here at OpenX, all you got to do is reach out on the webinar. We'll go ahead and do that. But here I just wanted to say a little bit about how open audience interacts with collecting first party data on a publisher's domain, um, persisting the rights that go with it and any identity that's been established with a provider that we partner with. And so you see OAJS at the top there, a couple things going on with OAJS. One is, of course, we're just passing raw partner identifiers through to the bid stream and other exchanges. I get asked a lot, is this something that just works in your exchange? And the answer is no. We, the idea is for us to take friction out of using multiple IDs, not adding to it. Nobody needs that. Um, so one of the things we're doing in the top left there of the diagram is we're just passing uh, identifiers uh, through as we see them with OHAS. That doesn't preclude any publisher from using Prebid's identity module. They coexist peacefully. Okay, um, and on the on the right hand side, you see um, the three things I mentioned before about writing first party data to the publisher's domain come into play. That's where all of the rights need to live, kind of on the edge um, in in our mind, um, yeah, with every publisher. Now, down below, you have an, a pub encoded version of, of, uh, of those identity partners and any first party rights that's going into open audience in such a way that we can associate subscriptions that Todd has with publisher A, B, and C towards that unified view of him across the open web. So the way that that's expressed in terms of it being usable and targetable and bring money to publishers and to give marketer scale is through the OAID. 
So, um, and, 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 and that's just one way, that's a publisher view. The other way is we expose all of this uh, um, aggregate data in the view of a deal. Uh, so it's very easy for a DSP to target a universe that includes Todd's uh, 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 foot, footprints across these three publishers in a single deal um, that they've targeted for a long time. So we think that the future of private marketplaces is going to emphasize audience to a degree. And open audience is a way to get that information, that identity and additional context about a consumer user into the bid stream on the one hand, and on the other hand, straight up to the DSPs for targeting and optimization, all the good work that they do with their campaign management and deployment today. Okay, and so how does this play out for the consumer? Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a little bit of, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a remedial thing, but I, it's worth saying that when publishers control um, you know, data collection usage and, and they can opt into a cross domain view of their users for scale, call it an audience PMP. Be really bold and call it a multi-party audience PMP, meaning publisher A, B, and C are together in cahoots to make more money by giving more reach to permitted um, audiences. So Todd is now going to get, because there's a, a, a permission, specific permission for personalization um, on publisher A, Todd is going to get an ad. Um, he's going to get an email newsletter ad. Uh, maybe through live intent on publisher B. And on publisher C, uh-oh, no permission exists for Todd. We are going to have to sadly block that advertisement in the deal his ID exists. Okay, what's, what's important about conveying this picture is that this is exactly how the walled gardens work. Okay, this is exactly how Facebook works. You don't have to think about rights between publisher A, B, and C. You have to think about do I have an ad set that's a mobile ad set? Do I have a, an ad set that is going to get to Todd as the user where he is on the device he's on? But you don't have to think about all this other stuff, which is something that is really, really important to keep talking about as we go through kind of our work together and our partnership. We wanna make a very seamless supply side experience possible for marketers to reach and we never want to ignore the power that our publishers have in opting into or, or opting out of that experience. Um, so that's what this is all about. Let me kind of go on now. I'm going to go into the sum of the parts that we just went through. Because um, this, uh, this is a lot of, uh, of, of, big, of big pictures. I, I hope I, I've been simple enough at a level for this to be useful. Um, and I want to know, um, you know, be, be, don't, don't feel like you have to be polite. Um, let us know how to make this a better forum for you. Um, so I'm just giving you what I call the open audience architecture. Okay, this is, this is how our product is, is architected um, in a way, but it a, has a marketing bent to it. So um, if you zoom out from all of what we just looked at, Basically, we've concentrated on open audience data and this work that we've done to help publishers collect um, first party permission, first party data and permission that goes with it. And then in real time, use that to identify user Todd across his subscriptions and domains. Okay, that's in the left hand side there. And I did mention that everything that we do in that data collection effort is built to create monetization scale and take friction away, whether it's passing data through um, to, to the bid stream or to other exchanges, or whether it, uh, it's uh, uh, monetizing them in an audience deal does not matter to us. What matters to us is that we're giving every marketer the ability to reach their audiences more simply and better, so they spend more and our publishers are rewarded for that, okay? That's pretty much it. In the middle, you have OA Match. We talked about that more from an identity perspective. Um, and you see their live ramp and tap adder device graph partners. We work with live intent um, as well. Um, but we, what we didn't talk about is context that's provided in OA Match for segmentation, um, whether it be for targeting 
for personalization or for measurement. The idea that identity resolution done without the simple things like core demographics or context um, or an action a user took to buy something in store or on an e-commerce site is really a big disconnect in the ecosystem as well. Okay, so there's a there's this concept that somehow identity is going to replace the third party cookie and we're all going to be fine. But, but we think we need to go far beyond that. We think we need to solve for identity. We also think we need to provide marketers with valuable context and for publishers to understand valuable context about every one of their permitted audience members so that we take away barriers to money flowing. So that's what OA Match is. It's a way to aggregate multiple ID partners. It's a way to, to add data and context to every ID which is permitted and to play it back either into a collection of users on the publisher's side for resale or as a deal um, or a target set on the demand side. Um, so either way, you got both with OA Match. And then the last part, we're gonna, in the next uh, webinar, I think we have a plan to show everyone a bunch of UI. So how do you create these audiences? How do you uh, create scale from them? How do they get optimized? Um, and so forth. How does that work with your DSP or your agency if you're a marketer? Um, so there is a, a, a box here which, um, which specifically addresses on the right audience creation, modeling, and activation. Also export, because we don't think we're the only place this data needs to live. In the new ecosystem, it needs to go everywhere um, where it can legally. Um, so, so that's kind of it. That's open audience, multiple partners, um, whether identity-based or whether user context, uh, bookended by real-time identity resolution and on-page context with OAJS, that rights collection and anonymization going into OA Match, and on the other side, it coming out in better UIs, better PMPs, build a better audience PMP, better lookalike audiences for marketers that say, I'm still stoked about programmatic. I still believe in it, but I don't see the scale I need that Facebook gives me. We have an answer for that on the right hand side. So that's the market texture. If you go to the next slide here, <clears throat> and of course, everyone's going to get these slides. Um, so um, don't worry about, uh, about uh, uh, anything I'm zipping through, or you can hit it in the Q&A. But I wanted to basically say open audience is kind of more than just a bunch of pictures. It's bringing together some assets that we uniquely have as a company. We're pretty lucky, like 12 years in the business of being um, uh, uh, an exchange, sitting smack in the middle of demand and supply and doing everything we can to create liquidity, period. So what open audience is to me as a relatively new member of the OpenX family is <clears throat> it's something that sits on top of that 12 years of work with our publisher partners, which I mentioned, we've got 2,500. We're really reaching 95 of the top uh, 100 com score uh, pubs. A and, you know, we have been a market leading platform for, 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 for safety, for brand safety and for quality. Okay, so you, when you start with a foundation like that and you add... Uh, uh, an audience graph which federates identity across publishers and across ID partners, which adds fields of data that are useful for segmenting audiences or measuring them. Um, you have a pretty powerful combination. So those are the two things together. I, I dare I say, I don't think, um, and I'm a startup person, that uh, it would be easy to build one without the other, okay? And then, of course, you know, making it easy for people to get to in programmatic, um, you know, this idea of deal IDs that work with any DSP um, for us to be able to present the opportunity for every brand to build a custom audience like they would do in Facebook using their first party data, but across all of the open web or across just publisher A, B and C working together is really a step function away from what we've been able to do from the supply side. Um, so that's a big deal for us. And then, of course, just reemphasizing everything we do, privacy by design, 
Uh, everything we do, we are willing to open up and be specific about how data is received, how it is anonymized, where transformations happen, where it is stored, what state it is in. I encourage you to ask those questions of anyone you are working with in the space now, because um, you know we're seeing enforcement actions come up. We're gonna, you know, come here in June. We're gonna be seeing it for CCPA. And we want to be sure that we don't miss an opportunity together to propel our industry and programmatic uh, because of missteps, because we haven't designed for privacy and we're not compliant. Okay, and then maybe just a couple of quick ones to bring at home. I'll take some questions. Um, if you go to, um, to marketer activation, this is a little bit of a sneak peek for the next, um, the next session that we're going to do. Um, and that is, um, I, I just mentioned a couple of these things. Our marketers, we have a lot of folks running open audiences now, which is really cool. I, I think uh, maybe even the last time that we talked, we were only a few deals in, and now we're maybe 40 or so in, and the numbers are, are, uh, are going up pretty rapidly. So um, it's exciting to see and learn from those. But what, what we've been doing with our you know, marketing partners, our DSP partners, is We've been trying to dial in custom audience creation, as I mentioned, um, you know, this idea of, about um, using first and third party data together to, to build a higher LTV audience, lifetime value audience for a marketer is something that Facebook has trained people on. And, and now we're doing it uh, ourselves. Um, the other thing that we've done in the middle here is we've just created partner audiences. What, what these are collections of users that might buy durable goods over the holidays. Um, and and uh, we've exposed those as prepackaged for, for marketers and as deals. And that's been exciting too, because a lot of people really just want to hit the easy button while they're experimenting. They're not ready to do split testing or multivariate testing. They're not set up for that. So we have this concept of partner audiences. What's cool about partner audiences too is we can push partner audience uh, uh, data into every one of our publishers and we can see just how many IDs or just how many users, subscribers that publisher has that match. So if you're looking to up the monetization of a specific type of visitor or a specific subscriber, it's pretty easy to do when you know that they're well targeted for household durable consumption in the holidays. Marketers will pay more for that. So we're pushing this data into, um, like everything you see here, into our publisher partners. And we do that on our existing fee arrangement, um, which is pretty cool. Um, not asking you to buy a CDP, not asking you to, you know, um, reinvest hope in your DMP, just saying, hey, look, we want to solve the problem. Um, and then there's lookalikes. We're going to go into each of these UIYs in the next, uh, in the next uh, 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 webinar. And the other thing that we're going to do in the next webinar is, uh, you can just forward there, Calvin, one more slide. Thanks. Um, uh, this is a, a snapshot of partner audiences. I'll linger on this for a second while saying, in the next webinar, I'm really excited to share with you what we're learning and the deals that we're trafficking. Okay, we're doing all kinds of different activations now, whether they're top of funnel, whether they're mid funnel to, to, uh, um, to drive an in-store visit, um, or whether they're just straight direct response. Um, we have deals running for each of these. And you know we're learning a ton about how to get performance out of them, whether it's tuning for how supply is set up, um, or, or whether it's working more closely with a DSP on how to target slightly better, um, or whether we're working with an agency to test creatives. We're doing all that. So that's pretty cool. And I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, I'm excited to share some of those early results, like what they say they call the green shoots of success. It's very early, but, um, and we're humbled by it, but we're, we are also excited to share some of those results. Okay, I think uh, um, when you get this deck, uh, everyone, you're going to see there's, you know, there's some screenshots of UI um, that that uh, are further on there. I just um, I'm going to blow by those um, because I am anxious to take any questions and uh, you know otherwise just uh, uh, wish everyone well and um, and uh, and on with our daily routine. So I'll take the questions now.
Thanks, Todd, for your insights. And um, we do have a few questions here. Um, and let me uh, let me go ahead and ask those, and uh, you can respond to them. Uh, the first one is, uh, what would be your recommendation to pubs that do not have a significant amount of authenticated traffic? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, you know, while we have the cookie, you know, we should be taking full advantage of it. As I mentioned, you know, there, there's no, unfortunately, there's no quick cutover for any of us. So we want to start working with you now on open audience um, and and leveraging the cookie while we have it. And of course, we're set up to do that. Um, and the, the other thing is. Um, we would love to work with you to share our observations, best practices, get you together with other folks in our community to talk about what's working, um, meaning uh, uh, what's working to collect first party data. So answer is let's work now. Um, let's uh, take advantage of cookies while we have them uh, in a, in a, in a kosher way, in a privacy compliant way. And then secondly, um, let us help you think through your first party data strategy. We realize it's it's a, a long road. Great, thank you. Um, next question, as uh, as an advertising advertiser bidding on the open exchange, how uh, could I target one of your partner audiences? Well, um, uh, it's uh, it's it's pretty simple. You you know we'll get you a deal ID and you can target it. I mean, literally as quickly as you ask. We're we're ready to go on this. I think it, it, what what's really important is, do, you know, do you need more than the partner audience that we've configured? Um, you know, I've spent a lot of my career, you know, building and uh, segmenting audiences, and um, you know, I think uh, my my view of it always has been, you don't win by the combination of data elements. You win by test it. You win by test and learn. Um, we can help you with that. Um, so wh while I would love to say a deal, uh, a partner audience, which is basically a deal in programmatic parlance, is going to solve all of your marketing challenges, I know it's just a starting point uh, from experience. So what we'd love to do is share how we built a partner audience openly, transparently, and then talk about how you might want to set up a test. If you just want to test uh, budget into a partner audience as is, and you're happy with it, great. If you think there's a data element that's missing, that's you know we have access to in the three thousand in our catalog, great. We want to hear that and add it. So, we you know all of which is to say you can press the easy button, or you can go deep with us, and you know we're thrilled either way. Great, thank you. Uh, next question: Are you planning to monetize through uh, third-party demand partners? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you, when you say monetize, I mean, I think we're, what we're planning on doing, wherever it is, you know, privacy safe and compliant, is to bring more demand into programmatic from the platforms. So absolutely, um, and we're interested in hearing, you know, your ideas and thoughts. We have a lot of partners now. Um, or partners in the making that are that that are approaching us and saying, "Hey, look, you know, we have unique data to bring." Or they'll say, "We have a reach problem. You know, we're doing a lot of really good search advertising, but or we're doing great advertising on Snap, but we have a miserable reach problem. Can you help us?" Um, whatever the combination is, third parties are the name of the game. It's an ecosystem play. Um, we are looking to be open, hence open audience, um, not looking to create another closed system. So, you know, if you've got ideas, great, but the answer is a resounding yes. Great. Um, next question, um, is open audience uh, available globally? Oh, that's a really good question. So, uh, and this came up on the last uh, webinar too. Uh, open audience is US only currently. Um, but we are working on making the product available in EMEA um, in a way that that plays nicely with GDPR. Um, so more to come on this uh, uh, next quarter. Our first step in that is probably going to be the use of OAJS and just uh, flat passing um, identifiers, helping aggregate the view of how well uh, identifiers are working in that market. So one thing we hear 
from our publishers is, you know, all this identity stuff, really, it's for the birds until we start seeing what we're making with a given ID. And the mileage is varied. It's actually getting better. So uh, our view is uh, outside of the U.S., less uh, open audience match and more about just understanding the value of identity um, uh, as it relates to uh, uh, GDPR purposes and use and usage. So Q2 on that. Awesome. Uh, next question. Um, are you exposing IDs to other SSPs if I take OA.js um, will, or will it only work with OpenX? I think you answered this, but maybe go into a little more detail on that. No, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, ever, the answer is yes, we are exposing IDs to other SSPs, but it kind of depends on the ID solution for OHAS. You, you can see the ID partners that, um, that we, uh, that we currently support and we're adding those like literally by the month. Now, um, we got a roadmap for that. We can share. I think you know what's interesting, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Is you know how effective that approach is of just the pass through versus versus pre bid. Um, you know, I know I know many publishers are excited about the identity module in pre bid, and they don't want to see duplication um, uh, of uh, of on page uh, uh, libraries for obvious reasons because it decays the user experience, but. I think there's a, there's probably going to be some some uh, uh, some market feedback um, over the next couple quarters where we figure out how the two work together. Um, in any case, whether it's pre bid or whether it's OHAS, we're absolutely passing the uh, the IDs. Um, and what solutions? Uh, what ID partners are you are we working with specifically? And and can I know you said share roadmap, but do you can you just kind of mention those? Yeah, I mean, we, we're working um, right now, um, we're working with LiveRamp, the identity link uh, is their core ID that probably most people on the call are familiar with and the Trade Desk Unified ID. Those two were kind of our, our anchor tenants, if you will. Um, we have, uh, uh, to that, we added TapAd, where there's a, obviously a lot of mobile device strength I mean, live intent, which uh, has a lot of email uh, strength, and we're in the process of uh, of testing ID five for uh, for the European market specifically. There will be others. Um, I'll go ahead and append a slide that gives the roadmap for this year. Um, I, uh, one that is mentioned in the deck that I'm personally excited about. Because um, I've worked with a lot of the folks there is Merkel's uh, Mercury ID. Um, so um, M1 um, is a uh, um, is kind of a first generation version, I think, of open audience. I, I like to think of, uh, being modernized massively with the Mercury ID. So we want to carry that ID too. Right now, the enemy, I think, of all of us on the phone is anything that slows down scale and audience performance. Um, that is an ID audience. And if that's a regulatory thing, that's a problem. If that's uh, too many touches, the match rates go down, that's a problem. If it's we don't have the right pool of demand because we don't support the, the right ID, one that I haven't mentioned, those are all in the way of our success together. And we've got to make sure that we're all thinking that way. So if you have a pet ID that I, that I didn't mention and you've got specific demand behind it, We'd love to hear. Um, I should mention just in closing on that one, of course, um, you know, the holding companies, several of them have their own um, IDs. Um, obviously, Merkle is is, uh, is Dentsu uh, company now, um, but no different with Axiom, my old alma mater being part of IPG and, and uh, Epsilon um, as well. Like, uh, so we'll be supporting, um, you know, their, their IDs um, in, uh, I would say post haste. Um, because we want to make sure all the dollars that are being managed by a, a holding company is finding its way into programmatic instead of in, 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 into a Facebook. Got it. Well, we have a couple of more questions. Um, we have a, a little over three or four minutes left. Uh, so if anybody has, we probably have room for one more question. <clears throat> There's a, someone's asking a question, Todd, that uh, is more of a, 
uh, support issue. Um, and, and I think they're trying to, to catch us on something. I'll, I'll throw this out to you and, and see what your response is. Um, it says when using Firefox, we see warnings of fingerprinting coming from OpenX. Um, you know, parentheses, no other networks so far. Firefox will block this behavior and leads the user to believe this is unsecure. What is OpenX's response to this? Yeah, I mean, we've been working with, uh, with Firefox um, uh, on the exclude list. Um, I, I, I think that I would love to, to, um, to understand what you're seeing that would, um, that would indicate fingerprinting. I will say this, um, we are 100% against anything that resembles um, or, or is fingerprinting um, or any use cases thereabout. So um, uh, I think Firefox threw a pretty wide net on, on folks um, like OpenX and, and there were things going on, you know, 12 year old companies have done things in the past that could have been interpreted a certain way, but we've been working with Mozilla Foundation on that specific issue, just to make sure that they understand our method and that we are not using or supporting any fingerprinting. So whoever asked the question, that's a great question. Um, and I would love to know, you know, if you are observing something, what it is so that product wise, I can get that across, not only to um, our engineering team, but also uh, to, to legal um, who is working with, uh, with Mozilla. Great. Um, I have a question myself. We talk a lot about kind of current state and, and future state. Um, can you spend kind of like the last minute describing, you know, what our, our opinion is on that? Um, and obviously current state is uh, kind of the status quo with cookies and future state is, is, is what and what we're describing here. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's messy. The current state is messy. Um, and uh, but but it's also um, it's a it's a very uplifting time for anyone who has been trying to figure out um, you know how the ecosystem needs to evolve and has been held back um, because of of the third party cookie um, and because of the lack of privacy regulation around first party data rights. So future state is pretty simple. Um, it's the stitching together of first party data for me or anyone else on this call in such a way that publisher or brand can, um, uh, can clear rights and, and reach us. Um, and I don't think that's the browser's job to decide. I don't think, I think the browser needs to protect consumers from spurious behavior like fingerprinting, but I don't think that it's the browser's job to stitch together first party data and pass it. So the future state, I think, is this belt of stitched first party data and data rights. The here and now is it's a bit of a mess. I would be um, I, I would be asking more questions and pinning people like myself or our companies for details. There's a lot of just jibber jabber. I do this, I do that. Um, uh, and I can tell you, I sit on the IAB Tech Lab board. Um, you know, the, the, it was like around a lot of brighter minds than myself, there are a lot of unanswered questions right that now. Don't panic, ask a lot of questions, do some experimentation, um, draw on what's working and make people pro put proof behind it. Um, if you want to go testing IDs, go for it, but ma make sure that people are justifying, um, you know, what the investment looks like um, and giving you data. And that includes us. How are these deals performing? What do you see working? I think the companies that are going to rise in through, through this mess are the ones that are accessible and transparent um, and take the, the, the kind of nonsense out of the transition period that, that can be you know, symptomatic. That's great. Thank you. And we've, uh, we've run out of time, folks. Uh, I want to say thank you for t attending today's webinar. Again, as a reminder, we will be sending out a link uh, to this uh, via email shortly. Um, we will also archive it on our, our website and under our video resources. We'd like to thank our speaker, Todd Parsons, and everybody that has attended today. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day and be safe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.